As the first director of UNESCO, Sir Julian Sorrell Huxley wrote a paper entitled UNESCO Its Purpose and Its Philosophy in which he outlined his vision for the newly created international organization, which grew out of the League of Nations Institute of Intellectual Cooperation. According to Huxley, the guiding philosophy of UNESCO should be what he termed, world evolutionary humanism. The following article describes this philosophy and its relation to eugenics. Julian Huxley, an evolutionary biologist, humanist, and ardent internationalist held many titles including Secretary of the Zoological Society of London, First President of the British Humanist Association, Vice President and President of the British Eugenics Society. He was also a founding member of the World Wildlife Fund, coined the term transhumanism, as a means of disguising eugenics, and gave two Galton Memorial Lectures. Huxley also received many awards including the Darwin Medal of the Royal Society, UNESCO's Kalinga Prize and the Special Award of the Lasker Foundation in the category Planned Parenthood, World Population, to name but a few. He is also the grandson of Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, and brother of author Aldous Huxley. The fundamental task of UNESCO is to help the emergence of a single world culture, with its own philosophy and background of ideas, and with its own broad purpose. This is opportune, since this is the first time in history that the scaffolding and the mechanisms for world unification have become available, and also the first time that man has had the means, in the shape of scientific discovery and its applications, of laying a worldwide foundation for the minimum physical welfare of the entire human species. And it is necessary, for at the moment two opposing philosophies of life confront each other from the West and from the East, and not only impede the achievement of unity but threaten to become the foci of actual conflict. You may categorize the two philosophies as two supranationalisms, or as individualism versus collectivism, or as the American versus the Russian way of life, or as capitalism versus communism, or as Christianity versus Marxism or in half a dozen other ways. The fact of their opposition remains and the further fact that round each of them are crystallizing the lives and thoughts and political aspirations of hundreds of millions of human beings. Can this conflict be avoided, these opposites be reconciled, the syntheses be resolved in a higher synthesis? I believe not only that this can happen, but that, through the inexorable dialectic of evolution, it must happen, only I do not know whether it will happen before or after another war. UNESCO Philosophy of World Evolutionary Humanism From UNESCO its purpose and its philosophy. But in order to carry out its work, an organization such as UNESCO needs not only a set of general aims and objects for itself, but also a working philosophy, a working hypothesis concerning human existence and its aims and objects, which will dictate, or at least indicate, a definite line of approach to its problems. Its main concern is with peace and security and with human welfare, insofar as they can be subserved by the educational and scientific and cultural relations of the peoples of the world. Accordingly its outlook must, it seems, be based on some form of humanism. Further, that humanism must clearly be a world humanism, both in the sense of seeking to bring in all the peoples of the world, and of treating all peoples and all individuals within each people as equals in terms of human dignity, mutual respect, and educational opportunity. It must also be a scientific humanism, in the sense that the application of science provides most of the material basis for human culture, and also that the practice and the understanding of science need to be integrated with that of other human activities. It cannot, however, be materialistic, but must embrace the spiritual and mental as well as the material aspects of existence, and must attempt to do so on a truly monistic, unitary philosophic basis. Finally it must be an evolutionary as opposed to a static or ideal humanism. It is essential for UNESCO to adopt an evolutionary approach. If it does not do so, its philosophy will be a false one, its humanism at best partial, at worst misleading. We will justify this assertion in detail later. 
Here it is only necessary to recall that in the last few decades it has been possible to develop an extended or general theory of evolution which can provide the necessary intellectual scaffolding for modern humanism. It not only shows us man's place in nature and his relations to the rest of the phenomenal universe, not only gives us a description of the various types of evolution and the various trends and directions within them, but allows us to distinguish desirable and undesirable trends, and to demonstrate the existence of progress in the cosmos. And finally it shows us man as now the sole trustee of further evolutionary progress, and gives us important guidance as to the courses he should avoid and those he should pursue if he is to achieve that progress. An evolutionary approach provides the link between natural science and human history. It teaches us the need to think in the dynamic terms of speed and direction rather than in the static ones of momentary position or quantitative achievement. It not only shows us the origin and biological roots of our human values, but gives us some basis and external standards for them among the apparently neutral mass of natural phenomena. And it is indispensable in enabling us to pick out, among the chaotic welter of conflicting tendencies today, those trends and activities and methods which UNESCO should emphasize and facilitate. Thus the general philosophy of UNESCO should, it seems, be a scientific world humanism, global in extent and evolutionary in background. What are the further implications, practical as well as theoretical, of such an outlook? We must examine these in some detail before coming down to a consideration of UNESCO's activity section by section. Our first task must be to clarify the notion of desirable and undesirable directions of evolution, for on this will depend our attitude to human progress, to the possibility of progress in the first place, and then to its definition. But once more a new and more efficient method of evolutionary change is available. It becomes available to man through his distinctively human properties of speech and conceptual thought, just as natural selection became available to life as a result of its distinctive properties of reproduction and variation. Objectively speaking, the new method consists of cumulative tradition, which forms the basis of that social heredity by means of which human societies change and develop. But the new method also has a subjective aspect of great importance. Cumulative tradition, like all other distinctively human activities, is largely based on conscious processes, on knowledge, on purpose, on conscious feeling, and on conscious choice. Thus the struggle for existence that underlies natural selection is increasingly replaced by conscious selection, a struggle between ideas and values in consciousness. Evolution in the human sector consists mainly of changes in the form of society, in tools and machines, in new ways of utilizing the old innate potentialities, instead of in the nature of these potentialities, as in the biological sector. Nor does it mean that man's innate mental powers could not be improved. They certainly were improved presumably by natural selection in the earliest stages of his career, and they could certainly be improved further by deliberate eugenic measures, if we consciously set ourselves to improve them. Meanwhile, however, it is in social organization, in machines, and in ideas that human evolution is mostly made manifest. Eugenics In the philosophy outlined above, there is a lot of high-sounding idealistic language about equality, for example the quote below. Further, that humanism must clearly be a world humanism, both in the sense of seeking to bring in all the peoples of the world, and of treating all peoples and all individuals within each people as equals in terms of human dignity, mutual respect, and educational opportunity. Of course, for eugenicists like Huxley, some are more equal than others. There are instances of biological inequality which are so gross that they cannot be reconciled at all with the principle of equal opportunity. Thus low-grade mental defectives cannot be offered equality of educational opportunity, nor are the insane equal with the same before the law or in respect of most freedoms. However, the full implications of the fact of human inequality have not often been drawn and certainly need to be brought out here, as they are very relevant to UNESCO's task. Still more important, any such generalizations will give us a deeper understanding of the variations of human nature, and in doing so will enable us correctly to discount the ideas of men of this or that type.